We're coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club. It's week to week, the political roundtable for the week of August 13th, 2018. Welcome, everybody, to our program. Uh, recently, conservative commentator Anna Navarro tweeted, quote, the Russians, Michael Cohen, Omarosa, is there anyone who didn't secretly record Donald Trump, unquote? <laughs> Brian Guest responded, Obama. <laughs> Well, I'm John Zipper. I'm pleased that we're recording tonight's program. I'm your host for Week to Week and the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. On today's program, we're going to discuss everything from the Space Force to the DMV and everything in between. Uh, everyone's welcome at the Commonwealth Club. No, it doesn't matter where you fall on the political spectrum, so any opinions that are expressed up here tonight are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Let's meet our panelists today. I'll start at the far end of the stage there with Bob Butler. He's a reporter for KCBS Radio. You can follow him on Twitter at BobButler7. So welcome back, Bob. Next to him and joining us for the first time is Daryl Ng. He's the managing director for W2O Group. Excuse me. Uh, he's also the former director of rapid response for the Romney-Ryan campaign, former spokesman for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he's on Twitter at Daryl Ng. So welcome, Daryl. <laughs> and next to me is another panelist making her week-to-week -week debut. It's Pat Thurston, talk show host with KGO Radio, and you can learn all about Pat Thurston on Twitter at Pat Thurston. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> There are question cards spread throughout the room. Please send up your questions. Someone will collect them, give them to me, and I'll try to work them into our discussion here tonight. Let's start with the Space Force, <laughs> because I want to. Um, <laughs> recently, the president declared the need for the United States to have a new branch of the military, something he's calling the Space Force. While many people were still trying to figure out if he meant that seriously or if this was you know, just kind of thrown out there as a wild idea to get people arguing. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence gave a speech saying, yep, it's real, uh, but they want to have it launched by 2020. And in fact, we're trying to get opinions from the public about how to design the logo for the Space Force. Mm -hmm. So serious or not, what do you think of this, Pat? Well, you know, that's the most important thing, is to have a really good logo. <laughs> um, you know, it's so easy to make fun of it. You know, pew, pew. And you think about the, uh, the stormtroopers from Star Wars. That's what it seemed to me that he was talking about. But there are two things. One is, we've got international treaties about militarizing space. So if we're going to actually have a space force that's involved in the militarization of space, we need to be abundantly careful about those international treaties. But oh wait, it's Donald Trump. We don't <laughs> seem to care about international treaties. It means nothing. But the second thing is, it's not as loony as it sounds. Yeah, it's true. I always hate to defend Donald Trump. But the truth is, there are some reasons um, that we do have efforts going on in space right now. They're currently being handled by the Air Force, and the Air Force itself used to be part of the United States Army, and some of you may remember that. It was the Army Air Corps, and then ultimately they branched away because of, you know, they needed to because it was very different from what ground troops were doing. As far as the Space Force is concerned, a lot of it, my understanding is, has to do with satellites and the concern for various ways to attack us. It's not all about the weaponry, the lasers. Wasn't that Ronald Reagan and the lasers? Star Wars. Yeah. Star yeah, Wars, yeah. yeah. It's not all about that. There are a lot of ways to get to us now, as we know from the 2016 election. So I think there may be... <laughs> There may be some validity to the idea. I don't know that it, this is the right time for it. How much money is it going to cost? Has anybody looked into that? Why are they talking about the stupid logo before they've actually designed exactly what the purpose was going to be? Who's going to staff it? What the qualifications are going to be? What are the implications with international uh, allies? Uh, there are so many other questions that need to be answered, and it's being handled now admirably, from what I've read, by the Air Force. So do we really need to rush on this? Aren't there some other things that are really demanding our attention? Daryl, what do you think? So I think this is an issue where we have the wrong messenger, but a actually not nonsensical policy. So when you think about um, 
the threats that we face internationally, we have Russia and China. What do they want to do? They're looking to figure out how to dominate the 21st century. Oh, you're forgetting Canada. I'm Canada. sorry. Well, <laughs> yeah, when just, Justin <laughs> needs to, to watch out for us. Um, but, you know, I, I think in all seriousness, you know, I got here today using Google Maps. Google Maps uses GPS, and uh, technologies like that are at risk. From Russia and China, you have instances where Iran can fake GPS coordinates to make one of our drones land in Iran so they can reverse engineer it. You have instances where in the Ukraine, Russia is faking the GPS signals so that, uh, that our, our Navy ships appear to be on land. So we know that our enemies are out there trying and um, fine-tuning these technologies so that if we ever face a war, um, they'll be able to unleash it, and we need to make sure we're ready. You mentioned um, Google Maps. It, it often takes me in the wrong direction. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, I, I think the U.S. Air Force Space Command could handle that right now. Um, I think the amount of money we're talking, the initial outlay is $8 billion. And I was reading somewhere that that would house every homeless veteran that we have in the country. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure it's really worth it. I mean, it's just ironic that it's going to come up in 2020 um, during the re-election campaigns. So that will be something you can talk about. But I don't know that a space force per se is necessary, but to your point about our satellites, yeah, we have to do a better job of making sure that our infrastructure, um, our high-tech infrastructure is protected. Because obviously it wasn't uh, during the election in 2016, and there's been nothing done to protect it since no. then, not on the national level anyway. So maybe that's some of that money could be used for that. And someone in the audience points out NASA We've forgotten about that you know, largely. You know, I was looking into um, NASA. I was wondering, you know, what's the difference here? Why isn't NASA handling this? And apparently, uh, and I, I don't know this, I'm no expert on it, but apparently NASA is, uh, first of all, it's, it's a very unusual entity. I think Donald Trump's going to shut it down. You know why? Jim Hansen from NASA, he's really big on global climate change. So I think <laughs> Donald Trump will say that NASA, we don't need NASA anymore, and instead we'll use that funding, whatever the Fed's putting into that, and we'll use it for Donald Trump's Space Force. And I have a feeling the name's going to undergo a change, too. It's going to be Donald Trump's Space Force. You know, but NASA is supposed to be about exploration <laughs> and gaining new information and insights. It's not supposed to be about protecting us and our satellites and our infrastructure in space or terrestrially. Uh, I was looking at uh, reporting over the weekend where they went to a, uh, a rally uh, with Trump supporters and they asked about NASA and they said, well, NASA lies to us. They're not going to tell us the truth. Oh my God. Donald Trump will tell us the truth. I will add, though, by the way, on a political point, uh, the, the reason why you know they won't shut down NASA is because all the jobs are based in Florida. Florida's a swing state, so it will not happen. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. That's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, as I understand it also, in order to actually create another branch of the military, this has to go through Congress. Yeah, right. So and they better get it done before uh, November yeah. or January. Yeah. yeah. We'll see if Nancy Pelosi wants to do it next year. <laughs> It'll be uh, Nancy Pelosi's Space Force. <laughs> 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 Excuse me. Well, let's, let's bring this down to earth and uh, talk about, if you will, some conspiracy theorists and uh, how social media companies are handling them. Yeah. Uh, Far-right conspiracy theorist Alex Jones has had some of his online videos and accounts, well, you've heard of them, uh, <laughs> either banned, deleted, or suspended by YouTube, Facebook, Apple, Vimeo, Pinterest, and Spotify, but not Twitter. Twitter says they haven't violated... Uh, Twitter's uh, standards, their, their use for their customer posting for against uh, hate speech or harassment. Bob, what do you think about the, what the companies have done and, and what do you think about Twitter's different approach to this? You know, it's funny that Twitter would say it hasn't violated its, its standards on hate speech. Anybody here on Twitter and do you see, I mean, it's Twitter and Facebook, when you see the comments on certain posts, there's nothing but hate speech there. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand what they're saying, but I, I, I hate to shut down anybody's free speech, but when your free speech is totally full of lies and a conspiracy that hurt people, I say shut it down. Daryl, thoughts? You know, I, I wrestle with this because Alex Jones is an idiot, you know, clearly. Or, yeah, to the back, he's... Maybe he's a very savvy manipulator, but either way, what he's spewing is not correct. You know, I think the problem is when you start shutting these entities down, because who is the judge? 
Um, you know, over the weekend, somebody who, an editor of The Verge, which is an online um, tech and, um, I don't know, uh, publication, you know, advocated that they should take Fox News off of cable channels. And, you know, I, I think there are problems with what Fox News reports sometimes, but I don't think we would advocate sometimes. for that. <laughs> you know, I would say their, their news is probably not too bad. I would actually agree yeah. with you uh, in the during the day yes. with Shep and, and sometimes Brett Baer. Yeah. They're, they're journalists, yeah. and they act like journalists. It's the evening programming, right. and that morning, what do they call it, Fox and Friends Fox is really Friends. the problem. Yeah, who's that Fred Flintstone-looking guy? Oh. Sean Hannity. <laughs> <laughs> I have a story about Alex Jones. Um, Please do. I have a friend. Um, I haven't actually spoken with her in, in years, but I still consider her my friend, up in the North Bay. And she's one of the people who gets the big protest together at when all of the muckety mucks come from around the country, the male muckety mucks, for the Bohemian Grove. Do you guys know about that? Uh -huh. Okay, so Mary Moore is her name. And Mary has been infiltrating the boho for a long, long time. She knows people, she knows the hookers, she knows the weight people. And the, and, <laughs> And she goes in and she's able to get their agenda so that we know the kind of things that are being discussed. There are government people here, by the way, who are introducing public policy without public scrutiny. And this is what's got Mary's panties in a bunch. So Mary, so Alex Jones contacts Mary because he knows that she can get him in. So she does. She doesn't know about Alex Jones. She thinks maybe he's a legitimate journalist, but he's an alternative journalist. She gets him into the boho, and then she, he comes out, and they talk about it, and he goes away, and he puts together a film, and he releases the film. And the film is all about the child sacrifice that takes place there. <laughs> it's about the Satan worship that's going on. The men who are, you know, naked, and a lot of them are, they love to be naked and pee on trees when they're out there. And, but, you know, the rampant homosexuality of all of the world's leaders. And Mary was so horrified. But this is who Alex Jones is, and that's what she learned from him. And she told him, you know, none of that's true. You didn't see any of that going on there. You know none of that is true. He said, yeah, but they don't. But can I talk about what you just said? As far as, you know, censorship is a really, really scary thing. But these internet companies, you know, Facebook and, and uh, whoever, they're not, these are not government entities. These are privately controlled entities. Mm -hmm. I think they can choose. Yeah. Now, if it were, you know, with the broadcasting entities, that's different. They're licensed. These are licensed entities. Cable, it's a little wishy-washy, but they still, there's government regulation about all of this. I think it's different. The government can't shut you down by God, no matter how offensive, how ridiculous, how many lies, how much conspiracy. The answer to hate speech is more speech. But if you're a private entity, you can tell Alex Jones to go straight to hell, and I think they all should. <laughs> A little bit more of Alex Jones's uh, high highlights, I guess. He uh, claimed that the United States government was involved in the Oklahoma City bombing and the 9-11 attacks. He has attacked the survivors of mass shootings, calling David Hogg a crisis actor, saying no one died at the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Uh, he's currently being sued by six families of Sandy Hook victims and an FBI agent for defamation. He was linked to the Pizzagate conspiracy theory, he claimed that the, the Chobani Yogurt Company was linked to a sexual assault and to increases in tuberculosis. Another lawsuit for, uh, happened there. Do you think, kind of what, what you just said, and I, I'll, I'd like to get all of your opinions. Do you think Alex Jones believes any of this, all of this? Is he crazy? What are your thoughts? No, I, the I last don't, two. I don't, th I, don't, I don't think he believes 90% of the things he says. Yeah. And he's even admitted that he is, he's an actor. He's up there acting, but he's acting in such a way where he's harming people, um, and I think that's why he should be He said out. that during his divorce proceedings, exactly. didn't he, when his wife exactly. said that he was harmful to their children. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, <clears throat> someone right. in the audience says, Twitter can start by shutting Trump. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? If they did that, it would cut their traffic probably by a third. <laughs> From Russia, yeah. Um, 
Let's move on. In fact, let's stay with Donald Trump because we always have a lot to talk about about the Do president. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how far we can get through this. Um, Pat, probably the juiciest political news this past week has concerned Omarosa, the former longtime Trump pal and employee who was fired last year and who just published a book about her time in the Trump White House. What do you make about what she's now doing, and do you consider her a reliable no. source? No, although even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, you know, the things about um, Donald Trump using racial epithets, she's not the first one to say that, and to say that it's on tape from The Apprentice, uh, Tom Arnold is someone who has also said that. Howard Stern has said that there are a lot of things that he has on tape that the Donald has said he won't release it because he doesn't want to stab Donald Trump in the back. I think ultimately those tapes are probably going to be made public. Um, I don't think Omarosa has a tape of that. She may have heard it. Apparently there was a Christmas party where he was spewing a lot of stuff. He was not only, you know, using racial epithets, but some horribly miso misogynist, as you might expect, terms. She's not credible at all. She's a hideous, uh, horrible. She's a, she's a <laughs> and and I don't mean that in in the honorable sense, you know, of, of you know a transaction of two willing people. I'm I'm using that in the sense of she will do anything for money. She joined Donald Trump's campaign. She joined his White House because of the money that she had there. And she heard him. She knew he was a racist. She knew he was a misogynist. She knew what a piggy was. And she didn't care. So I don't really care about her now. So it seems to me like Omarosa is a Donald Trump-like figure in Donald Trump's universe. She understands that the way for her to be relevant and to make money is to associate with him and then bounce in and out of his circle. Um, you know, uh, mm. she, um, she probably went in with this plan saying, hey, I will find out what I can do and I will write a book after. And if you want to sue me for yeah. breach of confidentiality, so be it. I'll make too much money from it. It makes sense with the taping that that's yeah. what she was doing. Um, you know, I, I think there are a couple of interesting things about her, though, and, and I don't mean to do this as a uh, defamation of character on her, because I don't, A, I don't know that that's possible, but B, that's not my intent. Um, <laughs> Pat, Pat already did that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is interesting, though, that, you know, I, I was doing research on her today, and I found out she'd actually been fired by a White House before. She worked for Gore and had been fired by Gore, and then really? worked for Trump and had been fired. So it's a rare person who can get fired by both Democrats and Republicans in the White House. <laughs> yeah, she's, uh, I mean, I... When I saw that she was going to be on this weekend, I'm like, why? Why? She's, you know, anybody, I mean, I'm writing a book. Does that mean I'm going to get on all of these shows? I don't know. But it's just... It, well, did you hear Donald Trump use the N-word? No. No, then. But, does that, <laughs> but, 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 but is anybody surprised? No. I don't think anybody is surprised to hear that, that he's done that. I mean, they heard what he said on the actual Hollywood tape. So, I mean, that was peanuts compared to some of this other colorful language he has used. But Omarosa, you know, I've met her before. I mean, I'm a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. I met her at, a, at, a, at an event one time, and I wasn't impressed. Um, everybody said, oh, that's Omarosa. I didn't watch The Apprentice, so I wasn't, didn't know who she was. But the fact that, that as you said, a broken clock is, is right twice a day, you know, it's very juicy stuff she has, the recordings of the president. That's, to me, the only value, but, you know, it's ironic that the president comes out today and talks about how she is a lowlife and she's not worthy of, of being here and nobody hated her, nobody liked her at, at the White House, but she, he kept her on for a year. Yeah, he did. And it wasn't until Kelly came in that he got rid of her. And when, she, when he did get rid of her, I wasn't sad. I mean, she, she got into it one of my friends, you know, April Ryan from American Urban Radio Networks who covers the White House. So, uh, you know, to me, she's worthless. But she, as you said, she fits right into the White House, lying, cheating, whatever you can do to get ahead. But I don't know that, uh, I guess I would believe a lot of things about what might happen in the White House. I don't know that he would have used the N-word in the White House. And the reason why I say that is until I hear the tape, I don't know that that's true because look, at, there are so many good journalists there. 
everything leaks out of that White House. How is it that Omarosa is the first one to uncover this? No, her, no. she's saying that it was during The Apprentice. Yeah, during oh. The Apprentice. Yeah. yeah, this was before he got became right. president. And, and like I said, I'm not surprised. I mean, look at his track record of things he's done, right. going back, back to when he was a landlord and not wanting to rent to black people, putting mm -hmm. codes on applications. So that doesn't surprise me at all to hear that he would say that. It doesn't, doesn't change my opinion of, of him at all, because I'm not surprised. What do you think about her taping something in the Situation Room? There are people who have said that's illegal. Do you think? Do I think you know it's. Uh, uh, I worked for the Secret Service. Really? Yeah, and um, I think it's outrageous, and I think it goes to the Trump White House that they just seem to have absolutely no concept of the importance of national security and the national secrets that we have. I mean, this is the president who walked the Russian guy right into the Oval and was showing him Israeli intelligence. And what in the world is wrong with this man? He can't hold anything. He doesn't understand what it is to govern. He un doesn't understand that there really are actors out there, foreign entities out there, that are determined to get to the United States. If Omarosa could record these things, one of the Russians could have too. Anybody else could have and that she had access to the situation room is even kind of weird what was she doing in there she's supposed to be doing outreach to african-americans what does she need to be in the situation room for to get fired yeah. well, to get yeah. fired <laughs> apparently that was the first time she had ever talked to general kelly oh, really? when she got when fired, he fired so he was, she was a senior staffer who was not i did not have access to the senior staff well she had access to, to the to the president though Sure. And he and he cut that off immediately. He she could just walk into his office and and from he said from now on you have to go through me. And she didn't like that. Kelly she complained. Did, yeah. She complained yeah. to the president about that. And it wasn't long after that that she was gone. I'm not sorry. No. <laughs> no. Well, another former Trump associate, his former campaign chief Paul Manafort, is currently on trial. Uh, last week, Manafort's uh, former associate and self-proclaimed partner in crime, Rick Gates, uh, testified against Manafort. Bob, what do you think about this trial? Do you think it's central to Bill, excuse me, to Bob Mueller's investigation of the president, or do you think it's all about getting progressively closer to the president? I think it's it's the stepping stones. I mean, all the things he's being he's accused of happened before he was on the campaign. It was not related to the president. Um, it's not related to the president's campaign either. But I think when you have somebody who knowingly doesn't file his tax returns on money he made illegally, there is a problem with that. And I think I was listening to somebody last week say, look, you don't file a tax return. You file a tax return and you lie on it. That's perjury. So there's six counts of perjury uh, that I think he's going to be convicted of. I, I'm, I'm, we, I don't know. Prosecution rested his case today. Um, and I think what happening, what's happening with, with the Mueller investigation is that you convict him on this trial and the one next month. And before sentencing, you say, OK, listen. What you want to do? I mean, do you want to get your hair, your hair dyed back? Do you want to st stay in prison for a longer period of time? And right. What can you tell us? Because you know, even 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 Amarosa said that if, if if Mueller calls her again, she has things to say. So we'll see what happens. Oh. So I think yeah. what this shows here is that they never thought they would win, right? If if you're knowingly doing illegal things, you would never subject yourself to the scrutiny of being on a presidential campaign and winning. I mean. The, you know, having worked on several, <laughs> you, you, you know that there's a scrutiny that, that goes along with the candidates, the staff, they go through everything you've written, everything you've tweeted, you know, and eventually it'll get to your tax returns if, if you, uh, when you get far enough along in the process. So it seemed to me like there were, uh, I'm not going to say everybody in the campaign, there were a number of people associated with the campaign who we're doing this uh, as either a joyride or as part of a, a larger scheme to make money and thought that it would never, I mean, they'd never have to actually govern the country and they accidentally Including won. Including Melania. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, you're, we talk as if Donald Trump is an honorable person. Um, <laughs> This guy's a crook from way back. You know, he's been hanging with mobsters. Roy Cohn was a, a conciliary to two mob bosses. Um, and Roy Cohn is, uh, Donald Trump has said that he's his mentor. Um, Donald Tr and he did the business that he did with the mob, all the things that he did. He, he is 
so crooked. He is so crooked. He is so bad that I don't think Mueller can get further in two years than barely scratching the surface. So I think uh, Manafort goes back. He goes back before he joined the campaign, before he was involved in Ukraine. He had a relationship with Donald Trump. All these people, all these people, every one of these people, you start looking at them, you start lifting up their shirts and opening their pants and Russia's in there <laughs> with every one of them. It is so bizarre. I, I can't remember who you said earlier, who said that um, he's, that Donald Trump, oh, it, oh, it was back there, so we haven't brought him up yet. But he said that Donald Trump is, uh, he's an asset. He's a Russian ass. He is. He's been compromised so badly. He is, pardon my language, I know it's a Commonwealth Club, he is Putin. <laughs> and I believe that, honest to God, and Putin was the one, the Kremlin, they were the ones, it was these oligarchs that allowed Donald Trump's criminality to proceed because he was broke. And it was the Russians who were involved in making him whole. And Manafort was connected to Donald Trump. Uh, Mueller, you know, went through Manafort because it's where the investigation took him. But I think if there is a God that Mueller is going to expose all of the horrible financial crimes that Donald Trump has been involved in throughout his life. Well, Wasn't his daddy a KKK member, by the way? Oh, there's some linkage back there to a yeah, uh -huh. protest. Mm. Um, David Frum made, made the argument when he was here a few months ago that uh, with Trump, what he thinks Trump is most afraid will come out you know, out of all this investigation is just how much his hotel and resorts are linked, are filled with oligarch money. Mm -hmm. You know, people who've bought a space and have never visited the state, they're parking money there. Yeah, um, for a know? reason. And now they yeah. own the President of the United States. Yeah. I, 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 view, I, I choose to view him not as a willing asset. I, I look at him as what they call a useful idiot. Yeah. Somebody, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say well, it like that. Well, he is that, an idiot. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is somebody who I don't think intentionally got involved thinking that he was going to be be compromised but he was so intent on saving his his real estate empire that he needed money he couldn't get loans from american banks that he wouldn't pay him back um, so he had to find the money somewhere and that's where it happened and i just it, it, you look at his properties um, I mean, I, the ones in Florida, this whole thing about chain migration and how Bellani's parents are now, are now citizens, and you have... Family reunification. Russian women coming over to the United States to have their babies and staying in Trump properties in Florida. <laughs> I mean, that's... Look it up. Google it. Yeah. It's actually happening. It's, it's called uh, something tourism. It's... Um, I forget the term they use for it, but it's, they have right. companies in Russia that say, if you're pregnant and you want to have your baby in the United States, come see us. We'll set it up. It's amazing. Although I, I will say, I, I don't think that's a phenomenon unique to the Russian community. I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles uh, in the San Gabriel Valley, and there are Chinese companies that do the same thing. And, you know, I, I guess I... I don't I, think they're staying at the Trump properties, oh. though. But does it matter? I mean, if, if we're... Yeah. I, I don't know that that's really relevant, right? If we're talking about... Uh, it's um, relevant. Well, I mean, if renting you're no, hotel... You're rooms, no fun, man. Yeah. No, it is. It's relevant. It, you know, and there's, there's the whole thing about him benefiting uh, and selling things and making all this money as president of the United States when he said he was going to divest himself from, uh, from these uh, interests. And he hasn't done that. He hasn't shown his tax returns. He hasn't had any transparency at all. And the most galling thing, in my mind, is that this guy doesn't have a defense for all the things that Mueller's going to find out. Mm -hmm. His whole strategy is to try to discredit Every investigator, every police officer, every FBI agent, every lawyer, any person at all who's seeking the truth, he's going to try to discredit them. And that's what, that's what I think happened with the Peter Strzok fire. Uh, are we talking uh, about explain. Ken Starr or are we talking about... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, it just as you probably have heard, Peter Strzok, the FBI agent, uh, was uh, fired today by the FBI. He responded with quite a Twitter flame, uh, attacking the president, calling him a dictator, et cetera. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, he's right. <laughs> he's either a dictator or a cult leader. I haven't quite figured it out. I wonder if you could be both. But he's, you know, uh, Peter, here's the thing that uh, my take on the Peter Strzok thing. First of all, I, I think they've 
pulled little pieces out of those texts and they take them completely out of context, but that's not what I want to say. The guy who made the decision, mm -hmm. he's a deputy assistant attorney general. So, yeah. This is the Trump strategy. I mean, you know, they're going after these people. They, he's, he's furious with Jeff Sessions. They want to now, the Republicans want to impeach Rod Rosenstein because he won't let the Russians interfere with an ongoing investigation by giving them all the material in the investigation that they can run over to the White House and give to Donald Trump. Thank you so much, Devin Nunes. Um, he's looking at getting rid of people so that he can put somebody up there who is willing to fire Bob Mueller to stop this investigation. And I think that's what the firing was about. I don't think there was a legitimate reason to fire him. I think he fired him as a message to Donald Trump, and I think, if, I think he could be promoted uh, once they get rid of Rosenstein, or, yeah, probably Rosenstein, and I think that'll ultimately, uh, that's the way they're going to try to end the Mueller investigation. We should be afraid. I'm not sure that they can really end it now. Um, I mean, you hear Republicans saying that's a red line, you, you've got to let him finish his work, but I don't know whether or not if he tried to do it, they would actually step up. They haven't stepped up so far. Yep. But... You know, trying to discredit the investigation is one thing, but there's only 27% of the country that believes what he says when it comes to the investigation. Um, Who believes what Trump says? What, what Trump says about, about this being illegal. In fact, even today, I was, as I was walking here, I was listening, and uh, one of the oligarchs uh, basically tried to get out of his lawsuit by saying that the Mueller investigation right. was illegal. And a Trump appointed or Republican appointed judge yeah, basically Trump said, uh, no, um, it, is, it is legal. Because that's what, you know, Rudy Giuliani has been saying that there's no basis for the investigation. I mean, even Devin Nunes' memo admitted that the investigation started because of Papadopoulos, not because of the, the dossier that they try to throw all this uh, water on. So, Well, and, and Mueller is also, what's the word, shared or pushed off his plate onto the New York uh, legal God. system, certain things. So even if Mueller's investigation were to be shut down, the New York stuff, that those folks can't be pardoned by Donald Trump. They don't right. work for Donald Trump. Um, so whatever is going to happen, it's going to continue for a while. Right. On that note, uh, someone in the audience asks, why does the media give so much coverage to Trump's tweets and to people like Omarosa? Every time there's a new tweet, I want to know what Trump is trying to hide, cover up. So I want to talk about one of his tweets. Uh, <laughs> the president recently tweeted about California wildfires, and, and I know Bob's <laughs> been covering it, blaming bad environmental wa uh, laws for diverting needed water into the Pacific Ocean. Pat, at least he got the right ocean named. <laughs> but... Experts have been saying, you know, basically everything else in this tweet was wrong. I mean, was there any, did he bring any attention to anything that needed to be highlighted or was this no. a total diversion? No. I, I actually spoke with um, the fire chief at Cal Fire about the tweet. Mm -hmm. And after he stopped laughing, he said that it was a, an absurdity, that it's ridiculous. He said, first of all, we have all the wild water that we need. You know, the fires are happening. There are these lakes. We can access the water. We don't use water for all of the fire control that we do. There are a lot of different things that we do. And, uh, it, and the idea that the water was being diverted so that it could run into the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> I mean, uh, that is perplexing. I know water diversions are a real issue. The Eel River in particular up north and salmon runs and what happens with the Russian River. That's a real issue, way too complicated for President Trump to understand. So instead, it's the water running into the Pacific Ocean. I guess he figures that environmentalists think that with global climate change, it's all going to evaporate and, I don't know, go out into space where you have to capture it with a space, space force. force yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I do think that it brings up, uh, every time he tweets something that is off base, I think there is a kernel of something in there that we should... We shouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt, but we should at least consider. And the question is, how do we manage our forests? Yeah. You know, there, there are serious problems with the way that we manage our forests, and we know because we've had the most destructive wildfires in the last several years that we've ever had. So while it may not be because the water is running out to the Pacific, we do need to consider, uh, have the policies that have been enacted there helped or hurt, and should we be doing something different? We're starting to do something different, though. There's at least been one law that's been passed that allows... 
um, CAL FIRE, they have dedicated crews who are going to be going in and doing some of the forest thinning that really has to take place. And it is true, the forest management has sucked, but Donald Trump doesn't know anything about that. I has think, he been uh, Bob, to a you've forest been reporting on this. I, I, I've, I've covered numerous fires. Um, I was just up in, uh, I was up at Cash Creek, was it last month when they had the big fire up there? Yeah. Um, Friday, I was covering the, uh, the death of the CHP officer, motorcycle officer, um, Kurt, uh, Kurt Griss, and as I finished filing my stories, I looked out and there's all this smoke and there was a fire burning in between Vacaville and Fairfield. It was a grass fire, not a, the kind of wildland brush fire that you see. But I think the, the biggest issue with these wildfires, you know, back in the day, when a fire was started in the forest, you, you let it burn. It would burn itself yeah. out, and that would be the end of it, new life and everything else. But now it's really our housing policies where we allow people to build homes in the middle of forests and that we have to go in and try to save the properties. We do need more homes. We do need more housing. But, you know, and the firefighters have a hard time getting to your house to save it. That's a problem. I mean, look what happened in the Oakland Hills back in 1991. 90, right. I was there. I was up in that, in that area, too. So I think it's more of an issue of housing. Um, and the president... I think it's are, more an issue of global climate change. Well, it's, it's a, a combination. Else. I mean, you know... We're, you, there's like at, four of the worst fires in California history have been in the last five years. And so there's a, a lot to that. And that's not just... They don't, they don't just count how bad a fire is by how many structures are damaged. It's how broad that fire is. They're growing, they're, they're burning with an intensity we've never seen before. They're moving faster because of the way the weather patterns are. And all of this is a result of global climate change. And we just want to pretend that it's not. It's, it's that too. It's building in areas where you shouldn't build because people want to. And that's true. You know, we talk about it when there's flooding. Why are people building in flood zones? Because they want to be by the river, but then somebody's going to have to bail them out. Uh, so you're right about that. But the worst problem, I think, is the global climate change. And so we have to do both of those things. Mm. We have to manage the forest, and we have to keep people, if they're going to build in those areas, then they have to make sure that they've got a protected area. Defensible that they've, space. Yeah. And if they don't, well, I can't say that if they don't have it, you know, you let them burn because you can't. But you don't let them build there without that. Now, would that be local laws that would change uh, zoning, or would that be I think it'd have to be state, state. wouldn't it? It would have to be state law, but, you know, each you know, municipality has its own zoning laws that you have to put in place. And so um, if you started really cracking down, and the reason cities don't want to crack down is because the developers come in and they provide money to cities, which have been suffering ever since Prop 13 passed back in the, what was it, the 70s? Late 70s, yeah. Yeah, late 70s. Well, one person who tweeted support for President Trump's wildfire comment was Republican Representative Devin Nunes. <laughs> um, now, he was also in the news this week, or last week, I should say, when uh, an audio tape was released in which he discusses the need for the GOP House to protect the president. Daryl, was that just kind of, yeah, of course, that's what the, the same party will do in government, or was he revealing anything else? I think it's not a secret that if the Democrats take over the House, and especially the Senate, that there will be investigations from now until Trump is no longer in office. So for him to say, we need to keep the House, we need to keep the Senate for political purposes of protecting the president, I don't think that's um, surprising. I do think it's surprising that uh, what people think is what he said out loud. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a true definition of a gaffe. It's when you speak the truth accidentally. And, and that's really what happened there. Well, he didn't speak it accidentally. He, spec he said it on purpose. He didn't know there was somebody in there recording him. Right. You know, he was, he's a, he was a fundraiser. Yeah. Another secret tape. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, um, I always have opinions on everything. I'm sorry to keep <laughs> you do? That's okay. popping up. But, but um, I think that the, uh, what he was talking about, and he said at the end of his tape, or we'll lose everything, um, Everything that they're, they're going to lose are all these stupid policies that they've been able to implement because they control, you know, so much of the government. But the thing that got to me is the very idea that the Republicans believe, and I think the Democrats do too. I think the Congress has forgotten 
who they are and what they're supposed to be. This is a tripartite system of government. We've got three co-equal branches. Do you remember when you were in school first learning about the Constitution and you learned that there was a system of checks and balances? The Congress has abdicated that. They're no longer a check on the power of the executive. If the executive is of the same party, then they're going to support whatever the executive's agenda and that, is. That's the argument George Will made, too, when he was saying, uh, that, you know, you should vote uh, to re remove the Republicans from power in the House because they're not fulfilling that job. But, but Democrats don't do it either. I know. Well, and they need to. And, you know, it goes, I think it goes to the other George Washington when he warned us against political parties. And maybe that's one of the things that's happened. We're more loyal to party than we are to our system of governance. Yeah, but the, the Democrats have tried to do things, but they can't get anything passed. With Trump, but did they hold Obama to account? I mean, they didn't challenge Obama. I love Barack Obama, by the way. But still, they, they didn't. That Bill Clinton, how many Clinton things were just so, he, you know why Republicans hated Bill Clinton? Because he stole their agenda. He started doing all kinds of things that the Republicans liked. Remember Graham Leach Bliley? I mean, that was Bill Clinton behind that. It's what put the nail in uh, Glass-Steagall, the Depression era laws that protected us from the horrible catastrophes that befall us when our economy fails and the bankers and the insurance companies are up to shenanigans. Bill Clinton was a part of that. Bill Clinton was behind the Telecommunications Act that we've all suffered right. from. Yeah. Well, that, that, that I, was, no, go ahead. I, I will agree that Congress does protect the president in power, but I don't know that they protected Obama as much. I'm not sure there was that much to protect from That's with Obama. That's true. Yes. Now, I will say this, um, speaking of Devin Nunes, I was actually talking to uh, his opponent's campaign today because I'm thinking I might be doing a story about this later, so I wanted to make a connection. And you know, some, a couple of interesting things came out is that Nunes is not campaigning. He's, been, he's run for re-election. This is his seventh or eighth time running for re-election. He's never had a real opponent except for the first time he ran. So he's been basically just you know, right, you know, mailing it in every time. Right. This is the first real candidate, op, you know, opposition candidate he has faced, and he's still up by 8 to 10 points. Um, but the interesting thing with that is he's not campaigning either. So in talking with them, they're saying he's not coming back to the district. He's not doing anything. We think we really have a shot. I don't know. Um, but they mentioned that the, the electorate, uh, the population in Fresno County is like 45% Latino, but only accounts for 20% of the vote. And one of the things they're trying to do now is to reach out to those people and tell them to register and, and vote. I don't know whether that's um, going to do it or not. Um, but one thing you mentioned about the, if the Democrats take over the House and the Senate, they may not get the Senate, but the House is probably an easier, uh, a, an easier task right now. People keep talking about impeachment. I don't know that they're going to impeach Trump. I think if they do get in, they will investigate for days. But, it, well, you know, <laughs> they're going to, they'll investigate. But if you impeach him, you have to make sure that you have the votes in the Senate, which I don't think you'll have. And do you really want to get rid of a president that does not know how to govern and put in somebody who does in Mike Pence? I mean, that's people I've talked to have, thought, have said, you know, that's the danger of doing that. So, yeah, but okay. Trump's a crook. Okay, well, that's going to have to be the last word on that topic. Let's talk about something that I'm sure Pat won't have any opinion on. DMV. So... <laughs> I saw a great little story today. Uh, let's see. This is from the Sacramento Bee. A State Department of Motor Vehicles worker slept at least three hours a day on the job for nearly four years uh, for an estimated 2,200 hours of work time between February 2014 and December 2017. Uh, she, the DMV was unable to take disciplinary action because they hadn't tracked it, and so they had no track record to discipline her for. Um, just one anecdote, but we've been kind of deluged lately with a number of anecdotes about incredibly long wait times in San Francisco. You can't make an appointment for more than 90 days, according to an article I saw last week. 
Um, and if you have an appointment, you still have to wait for hours yeah. just to get into the building to get a number. And yeah. that's when they start calculating your wait time. So when they tell you that the wait time is 23 minutes for people who have an appointment and an hour and 23 minutes for people who don't, that's a lie. First, you're in the parking lot for a couple of hours just waiting to get in the building. And if you've got an appointment for certain things where you have to take tests, um, in some places, people have been sent home. They've had appointments. They've been there on time, but they had to stand in such a long line that once they got in, it was past 4.30. They're open till 5, but it's past 4.30, and they say, oh, it may take you longer than 5 to take your test. You'll have to make another appointment and come back. Yeah. I talked to a lady who that happened to four times. So I'm thinking she needs to sue. I'm going to say, I think... Uh, I'm going to disagree with some of, I think, the facts of what you just presented. And I say this because I, wor and I worked for Schwarzenegger. You know, you split up the government and you work with different agencies. And the DMV was one of the ones that I worked with. And, you know, back then we used to say, hey, you know, this appointment system, it was new 10, 15 years ago. You guys should talk about how great the wait times are. And they said, no, at some point we'll have real ID and it's going to get real bad. Right. And, you know, we're now here and that's kind of what we're facing. But, right. you know, I actually personally renewed my license earlier this year. Anybody with an, uh, with an appointment walked right in. There's no line to get into the DMV if you have an appointment, but everybody else, it's hours long. I probably waited two hours in there, um, you know, just to go show them my birth certificate so I could get a real ID. You had an appointment and you still... No, no, no I, I did not have an appointment. I, oh, I okay. tried to so. use the online system. It was too clunky for me to try to decipher, so I decided to stand in line for two hours. You must have went to the one at the state capitol that the legislators used. Yeah, the tell tell, tell folks about that, Bob. Yeah. So well, the, uh, you should tell us about well, it. You probably so, know about yeah. it more than me. I uh, actually <laughs> did not. I went to the, uh, the public DMV. But there is, uh, there is an office in what's known as the Legislative Office Building across the street from the state capitol. Uh, the main purpose of that building is, um, you know, when you get mad at the DMV, you call your legislator, and they walk over and say, what's going on here? Um, in addition to that, they will handle, you know, normal DMV paperwork there. So for only for legislators and staffers. That's not anybody can walk in. Yeah. Anybody can walk into it, but it's, it, they don't. don't they don't advertise. So. Anybody, I, I could have walked into out it. Out of the story in the Quran, uh, they it's said not, no. It's not. not advertised, but they will not turn you it's away. It's room one twenty one. I, I have it from from the best source of all that anybody can use it. Yeah. Really? I said it on KCBS last Friday. Ah, well, there you go then. I stand corrected. At 7.50 in the morning. Okay. <laughs> it's also right next to the room where state legislators can get like a never-ending uh, chocolate fountain right. and, mm. and their back rubs. It's, it's <laughs> no. truly No, Willie Brown, Willie Brown said yes, anybody can use that DMV. Really? They just don't know about it. I know something Wait a that the DMV can do, though. Okay, we'll take, Bob, Bob first. You talk about the long wait time. So real ID, you've got to get it. Um, my license expires next June. I said, well, I might, you know, I had to get my new passport. Um, so I figured I might as well sign up to get my, my new license, my, my um, real ID license. So I went on the li online and looked to get a, an appointment uh, that was on July, no, June 24th. No, no, June 15th, I think. My appointment is September 18th. So it's a two month wait to get the appointment. And my DMV is out in Pittsburgh, and I've seen the lions outside. So I'm, you know, going to, you know, make sure that I'm available for the whole day to go do it. But it is a problem where you have to spend your whole day going to the DMV. I mean, why should you take a vacation day to get a license? And you know, this whole thing—they talk about voter ID. That's why people can't. We don't really have it in California, but that's why if you have to get a voter a voter ID, a, a, a California ID card, and you have a job, can you afford to take the time off to get one? Mm -hmm. Although you only need a real ID if you want to fly. Otherwise, you real can, ID. You can, yeah, you can get the the yeah. regular ID or have a passport and fly with it. Yeah. There's a. Um uh, on my talk show, we talked about the DMV. I think we've spent four hours on it so far. Um, so there from were beginning to the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had people call me from line. One guy said that he knew it was going to be a problem, so he brought a lawn chair and a cooler. But <laughs> but um, there was somebody who called who had some inside information that I thought was pretty crucial. By the way, um, out of all the calls I took, there were two who had positive experiences. Um, all the others had hours and hours, appointment or not. But this lady said that, um, be, you know all the windows that are always vacant, but we're all still standing in line? She said that each station, uh, the person is trained to handle one task. 
so that if you're so that if the person is doing driver's license renewals, they can't do your boat registration or vice versa. And so one of the things that the workers at the DMV are saying that could help, it's not the solution, but that could help is to cross train all these people so that anything that you need to be done, you can go to any window and you can get it done. They're hiring, they just hired five hundred new people. They said it's, it's going to we'll start feeling it mid September. Um, but if they're going to use the old system and just have one person trained per one window, I think we're still going to have the issues. If we can do some cross-training, uh, which makes me believe that one of the things government is really bad at is the same thing that private industry is really bad at. Ask the people who do the jobs. You know, why is this happening? What right. can we do to make it better? Right. Of course, at the DMV, you'll have to wake up the woman and then ask her. You have to wake her up. And then the other people are so surly. Oh, my goodness. So, but I, I think the galling thing, though, here is they identified this problem. They didn't do anything about it. Yeah. In the last several years, they've raised our vehicle license fee to pay for something. Why not the DMV workers so we don't have to spend that many hours in line? And why did, were there four Democrats who abstained from voting for an audit of the DMV when that was requested? Three Democrats voted for it. Three Republicans voted for it. Four Democrats abstained at the behest of the governor. And why wouldn't we want an audit of the DMV yeah. when we're facing these issues and they got, what, $47 million last year and they just got another, is it $27 million? Something like that. Something like that. You know, why, we don't want to just throw money at it. Can we have an audit and figure out what's going on? Well, the DMV director said it would be a strain on her resources. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, That's why. Lord have mercy. Well, on, on that note, uh, I wanted to talk actually about, I guess, kind of a number of things that are all in the, the race and politics center. And I wanted to start, start with Laura Ingram from uh, Fox <laughs> News, uh, a favorite I can tell. Um, last Wednesday, she complained about demographic changes caused by immigration that have resulted in, quote, the America we know and love doesn't exist anymore, unquote, and that most of us don't like these changes. Bob, who does she mean by we? Pardon me? Who does she mean by we? We is the 27% that voted for Trump. I mean, I don't think anybody could deny the fact that the country is changing. The demographics have changed. Um, my response to her would have been, well, if you hadn't have brought me over from Africa, you'd have a much wider <laughs> country, okay? It would be a much poorer country because you couldn't build anything on your own. Um, <laughs> if you hadn't have you know, invaded Mexico and taken California and Texas, you wouldn't have the browning of the country. You'd have, but then you also wouldn't have any food to eat. Um, <laughs> so I think it's an asinine statement, um, but it's typical of what you hear on Fox and conservative media. Um, it, it just, it's just, it's just, just disheartening for people, especially people of color, to hear people, people say things like that when you're talking specifically about us. Um, and you know, it's, and it's, it, anybody that's not white is who she's talking about. And a whole bunch of us aren't white anymore. So I think that there is a, uh, first of all, Laura Ingram is wrong both in what she said and what she intended and her tone. Let me first start with that. I, I think there is a related discussion, which is probably uh, something that we all, that society is trying to grapple with, that people who might um, be, be who, who might listen to her would also talk about. So, and the question is, when immigrants, like my parents, come to America, do you try to assimilate or do you try not to assimilate? Do you try to become your own separate community? And I think that's a related discussion that our country needs to have. You know, I, I think America is much better because of all the different ethnic groups that we have coming. But should we all try to add our, our own flavor to it or do you try to separate yourself out and have different ethnic enclaves that, that don't... Um, try to fully integrate with the rest of the society? And I think that's an important question. Well, you know, we, we've always been told that we're a melting pot, but I think most of us prefer to think of ourselves as a great big salad bowl, you know, that we don't have to give up what our heritage is and the things that we bring from our heritage to still be participants and to make the whole thing taste better. And there is such a thing as white fragility. You know, there are, you know, being white's interesting. You, <laughs> you have... Um, so many benefits that it's that you don't really recognize but when somebody starts challenging you on those things you get real worried about that you don't like to admit it you think they're calling you a bigot because you should recognize the privilege that you have 
by virtue of your skin color. And we should, we should recognize that because it's wrong. And when there are more people coming in who are more flavors, who are flavoring our salad better, you know, who wants a, a dank lettuce salad? You know, I, I kind of like the croutons and, and I like the, the cucumbers and everything else that, that makes us. And so, you know, white I must like say that's, that's actually a very white salad you just made. It really is. <laughs> You well, know, you know croutons are brown, though. <laughs> and you, you throw some the, raisins in there, too. You, you, know? Know, you know what the whitest food on earth is, though? It's tuna casserole. I am just really think it's the whitest food. <laughs> I was going to guess rice, but maybe that's just me. I was going to say bean salad with vinegar. Oh, that could be. No, I think tuna casserole. But I do want to say this. Laura Ingram said that what she said wasn't racist. I never intended it to be racist. It wasn't racist. It was only racist to people who want to see racism. Well, guess who endorsed her after she said it? Mr. David Duke mm -hmm. said it was the most important statement, the most important monologue ever to appear on the mainstream media. Um, it was racist. That's why he lauded it. That's why he applauded it. And she can't back down. It's on tape. When are these people going to realize that we're taping them? You're on TV. There's a tape. Does anyone know where Laura Ingram's parents or ancestors came from? No, but she reminds me of my sister-in-law, and she's creepy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're on the subject of race, participants in the so-called Unite the Right rally outside the White House were outnumbered by counter-protesters and police this weekend. Um, I don't know why they didn't go with Unite the White Right. I mean, if you're rhyming... <laughs> okay. Clearly, we haven't sent our best to this group. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but well, they're all in the White House. Well, I mean, <laughs> the so this has happened. The, these rallies seem to be a thing now, if, if you will. I mean, is this the new normal? And will there always be more protesters, counter protesters than the rally? You know, do, would that give people some sucker? Uh, or do we have to deal with more Charlottesvilles? And if so, how? I guess what I'm getting at, I'll start with Bob and just run down the panel. What should be the approach to people who are espousing very vile views? Should I, they be, uh, sorry, but I mean, is it best for them to be pushed underground where they flourish or out where they can be confronted? Well, that's where they've been all these years. I mean, yeah. you know, people talk about how Obama worsened race relations. He didn't worsen race relations. He just revealed the racism that was always, had always been there. Right. And Trump has made it flourish as he has embraced it. But I think... For these kind of groups, I say let them have their rally and just ignore them. Because, you know, when they have a rally like this, because of the, they know they're going to get the counter protesters, a lot of folks don't show up. But I say don't have any protesters. Let them have their rally. Don't send the TV camera. Let them just come and spout their nonsense and go away. Daryl? You know, I think that sunshine is the best disinfectant here. You know, when you're able to expose these people and their bad ideas, everybody, uh, the vast majority of people realize what a terrible idea these things are. And, you know, if we censor these people, it gives them, it makes them martyrs. If we, um, it, it, we need to let them have their say and have everybody realize just, you know, well, that's not the right way to go. It's just, it's idiotic. Yeah. Are they still denying that the basket of deplorables thing? Oh, well, they're embracing it. I mean, isn't that what we're talking yeah, about? This it. is the basket of deplorables that Hillary was slammed so hard for having stated. These are the people who supported Donald Trump. These are the people who campaigned for him. These are the people who have said he's on our side after the violence happened in Charlottesville. Have any of you seen yet? It just opened. Have you seen Black Klansmen? Oh, my God. I was so, and Bob saw it, he saw it before I saw it, I saw it last night with my daughters. Um, man, I had a hard time getting up from my seat in the theater. First of all, it's hysterically funny. It's a true story about a Colorado Springs police officer, a black officer, who goes undercover in the KKK. And it is hysterical, and it exposes these people, and there's so much blatant ignorance and racism and hate and nastiness that takes place. It's, it's uh, uh, Spike Lee at his absolute best. Yep. But at the, I, I just don't want to Don't give away the end. It, but we'll my get, God, it'll affect you. Jordan Peele, apparently. R right, yeah. exactly. What an amazing movie. And if you're not worried about Charlottesville, See this movie. I think if everybody in America saw this movie, I think we'd have a different perspective yeah, on there's, what's there's going on. There's a de definite bridge between the racism from the KKK in the 70s 
and what we're seeing today. And if no other reason, you, want, you should go see this because Denzel Washington's son plays the detective um, who, who was still alive and is on the, the circuit now speaking about uh, what happened. It's a fantastic movie. It was very, very powerful. Okay. Briefly, before we get to the news quiz, um, the NFL protests have started again. We're in the preseason. Any thoughts on that? Uh, and, and, of course, it's started again as a political thing. I mean, what, what approach should be, people take about that? Uh, let's start with you, Pat, and go down the page. It is the most respectful form of protest I can imagine. Um, these athletes, most of them black, are protesting the shootings of young black men um, that we have seen, that Colin Kaepernick started it. It is quiet. It is respectful, and it is while the national anthem is playing. And Donald Trump is an idiot and a racist and a moron and all the bad words that I can think of. He has, he's turned this into something that's, that's opposed to our military. I'm a veteran. I was never offended by Cap taking a knee. He's turned it into that. He's turned it into they don't love our country. It is a respectful form of protest. And I support these athletes a thousand percent. Okay, Daryl? So, you know, I think the most interesting thing to me is you have two big sports in America who, that are dominated by African Americans, you know, the NBA and the NFL. So the question is, why do we have disparate actions by the different groups, right? You have the NFL, athlete, NFL in general and their athletes can't get on the same page, the NBA can do it. And, you know, I think there are a couple differences. One is you have a set of younger owners who are much more sophisticated on the NBA side, and they understand uh, how to engage their audience and their players and how to uh, create positive change. On the other side, you have the NFL, where you have owners talking about the inmates running the asylum. You know, and, and it really is a bigger problem about you have you know, the NFL players who basically have inherited their teams from their parents, and the NBA player, uh, owners who have made their money, some of them in private equity and other places that you, know, you may or may not like, but it's, <laughs> it's a different sort of um, culture and a different sort of uh, circumstances that, that both leagues have. I think I, I actually was uh, meeting with Joanne Reed in New York a couple of weeks ago, last month sometime, and I said, you know, if the kneeling is such a big problem, what they, all, they all wear gloves. Wear black gloves and just do this during the national anthem. Have your hand over your heart. And that way they can't get you for kneeling. But I think there needs to be some kind of, not so much protest, but you got to call attention to what's happening. I mean, if you've, if you've seen over the weekend a police officer in Baltimore, you know, just beat this guy for, for it seems like no reason, uh, a black police officer. It's, a lot of this is not because of white police officers and black people. It's police officers and black people. This guy is, has now resigned, and he's going to probably face charges. But I think what the football players are doing, it's, they're just trying to, trying to call attention to what has been happening in this country. And I think had it not been for the president, there wouldn't even be a big issue. I mean, Kaepernick started it, more people started to do it. If, if Trump hadn't have weighed in, I think fewer people would be doing it, but they'd still be doing it, and people would say, oh, okay. But when you start saying that this is, you're, def you're defiling the flag and disrespecting the military, it's anything but that. But Cap didn't even make an issue of it. I mean, he did it for weeks before anybody even noticed it mm -hmm. because it was him. It's what he wanted to do. It was his form of protest. And initially, he sat. And then there was uh, I don't know, a friend of his, someone he was associated with. A, a veteran. Who was yeah. a veteran mm -hmm. who said that he thought that was disrespectful while the anthem was playing. And he said, what we do for our fallen comrades is we kneel. We take a knee. And so that's why Cap took a knee. Well, listen, we're going to have a lot more news quiz questions and so much more to talk about in two weeks. On Monday, what month are we in? August 30th? 27th. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we'll have, hopefully, some good food and cheer with all of you. Thanks to our great panel today, Pat Thurston, Daryl Lang, Bob yeah. Butler. Thanks. Thanks to all of you here in the room and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great week. <laughs>